Carl Sagan is one of the preeminent astronomers of our time. He is known for bringing the heavens to our living rooms with his PBS series Cosmos. His latest work is The Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark. It explores the country's growing fascination with pseudoscience, astrology, faith heals, the supernatural and the like. All superstitions that he says threaten to undermine true science. I am pleased to have him here, and I also take note of the fact that he is the David Duncan Professor of Astronomy and Space Sciences and Director of the Laboratory for Planetary Studies at Cornell University, Distinguished Visiting Science at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California Institute of Technology, and co-founder and president of the Planetary Society, the largest space interest group in the world, and a former Pulitzer Prize winner. Welcome back, sir. Thank you, sir. Great to see you. Uh, listen to this. I hate to read too much, but this is... It's almost like they've been reading your book. This is from the New York Times for Friday, uh, May 24. Americans flunk science, a study finds. Less than half of all American adults understand that the Earth orbits the sun yearly, according to a basic science survey. Nevertheless, there's enthusiasm for research, except in some fields like genetic engineering and nuclear power that are viewed with suspicion. Only about 25% of American adults get passing grades in a National Science Foundation survey of what people know about basic science and economics. I mean, this is singing your song, isn't it? Well, it's certainly what I'm talking about in, in, in the demon haunted right. world. My, my feeling, Charlie, is that um, it's, it's not that um, pseudoscience and superstition and uh, new age so-called beliefs and uh, fundamentalist zealotry are something new. They've been with us for as long as we've, been, we've yeah. been human. But we live in an age based on science and technology with formidable technological powers. Science and technology are propelling us forward at accelerating rates. That's right. And if we don't understand it, and by we I mean the general public, if it's something that, oh, I'm not good at that, I don't know anything about it, then who is making all the decisions about science and technology that uh, are going to determine what kind of future our children live in? Just uh, some members of Congress, but there's no more than a handful of members of Congress with any background in science at all. And the Republican Congress has just abolished its own Office of Technology Assessment, mm -hmm. the organization that gave them bipartisan, competent <laughs> advice on yep. science and technology. They say, we don't want to know. Don't tell yeah. us about science Surprising, and because Gingrich is genuinely interested, I think, in he these is. kinds no of things question. as a... You know, no out of a, his own intellectual curiosity. Does the president still have a science advisor? Uh, he does. House? He does. John Gibbon. And, and the vice president uh, is scientifically He's well known literate. For being yes. Scientifically, a science maven. I mean, you, you blast them all creationist, uh, Christian scientists who sh you say would rather allow their children uh, to suffer uh, than give them insulin or antibiotics. Uh, astrologers come in for particular scorn on your part. <laughs> well, I would say scorn, just uh, derision. Derision. <laughs> <laughs> a more generous version of scorn. You know? and, but what's the danger of all this? I mean, you know, this is not the thing that... There, there's two kinds of dangers. One is what I just yeah. talked about, that we've arranged a society based on science and technology in which nobody understands anything about science and technology. And this combustible mixture of ignorance and power sooner or later, is going to blow up in our faces. I mean, who is running the science and technology in a democracy if the people don't know anything about it? And the second reason that um, I'm worried about this is that science is more than a body of knowledge. It's a way of thinking, a way of skeptically interrogating the universe with a fine understanding of human fallibility. If, if we are not able to ask skeptical questions, to interrogate those who tell us mm -hmm. that something is true, to be skeptical of those in authority, then we're up for grabs for the next charlatan, political or religious who comes ambling along. It, it's a thing that Jefferson lay great stress on. It wasn't enough, he said, to enshrine some rights in a, in a constitution or a bill of rights. The people had to be educated, and they had to practice their skepticism and their education. Otherwise, we don't run the government. The government runs us. Jefferson was amazing in his devotion to science. We Absolutely. think of Jefferson as this man who was literate and who was a passionate def uh, articulator of freedom. But if you go to Monticello, exactly. 
What you appreciate is he was at heart a scientist, a botanist, an architect, geologist. A geologist. It, and if you Meriwether Lewis, as we know, you know from Stephen Ambrose, mm -hmm. you know, he wanted him to go out and do experimentations and explore and be skeptical and find answers to passages and explore the uh, West. Exactly right. And there was also an economic uh, yeah. grail right, there right, if the right, Northwest right, Passage right, was right. found. Uh, Jefferson said that uh, he was at heart a scientist, that he would have loved to have been a scientist, but there were certain events happening in America <laughs> that called to him, and so he devoted his life yeah. to that kind a of revolution. politics, indeed, yeah. so that generations later people could be scientists. Yeah. Have we, the point is made, and maybe by you, you know, is it, when's the last time we had a president who made a speech about science, you know, yeah, I mean, right. and made I us, say that. Yeah. Uh, it is this notion that, that science is of, not of great interest to us in some sense, that, that somehow we don't want to learn. You see, people read the stock market quotations and financial pages. Look how complex that is. And because yet, they manage. know the direct connection to their own There's a motivation, but they're capable of large numbers of people. People are able to look at sports statistics. Look how many people can do that. Understanding science is not more difficult than that. It doesn't involve greater intellectual activities. But the, the thing about science is, first of all, it's after the way the universe really is and not what makes us feel good. And a lot of the competing doctrines are after what feels good and not what what's okay. true. Okay, but you got to make, I'm not sure you'll go this far with me, but I mean, there's a lot of that that is about feeling good and there's a lot of that that's about hocus pocus, but at the same time, there are millions of people who understand science does not prove religion, but because religion is faith-based. And faith. therefore, you should de not deny the value of it because it is faith-based and not science-based. But let's, but let's, let's, look, let's look a little more deeply into that. What is faith? It is belief in the absence of evidence. Now, I don't propose to tell anybody what to believe, but for me, believing when there's no compelling evidence is a mistake. The idea is to withhold belief until there is compelling evidence. And if the universe does not comply with our predispositions, Okay, then we have the wrenching obligation to uh, accommodate to the way the universe but I think really you could, is. You, I mean, but I mean, you, so you step forward to say I deny all religion because I can't see no, it proved no, no, scientifically. No, no, no. You see, and the it, value it, of religious it, it, experience it, it, and the value of, of 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 reaching for higher experiences. Let me say, religion deals with history, with poetry, with great literature, with ethics, with morals, including the morality of uh, treating compassionately the least fortunate among us. All of these are things that I endorse wholeheartedly. Where religion gets into trouble is in those cases that it pretends to know something about science. The science in the Bible, for example, was acquired by the Jews from the Babylonians during the Babylonian captivity of 600 BC. That was the best science on the planet then. But we've learned something since then. Roman Catholicism, uh, Reformed Judaism, most of the mainstream Protestant denominations have no difficulty with uh, the idea that humans have evolved from other creatures, that uh, the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, with the Big Bang. They don't have any trouble with that. The trouble comes with people who are biblical literalists right. who believe that the Bible is dictated by the creator of the universe to an unerring stenographer. And so therefore they and, and has no metaphor or allegory. And in from it. there they make their political and economic choices. Uh, and social and, choices. And scientific. And scientific choices. And, and scientific. And that's part of your problem with that idea. Exactly. It is that because for the wrong reasons, we make the wrong choices about science. That's right. So who is more humble? The scientist who looks at the universe with an open mind and accepts whatever the universe has to teach us, or somebody who says everything in this book must be considered the literal truth and never mind the fallibility of all the human beings involved in the writing of this book. Mm -hmm.